Hey everyone, uh, this is the first part of a, uh, of chapter three of Brett Knai Paz's "The Sociology of Backwardness: Combined Development." Um, the section that I'm reading, in addition to the introduction, is titled "Social and Economic Development of Russia: The Impact of the West." All right, so here we go. The most primitive beginnings and the latest European endings. And excuse me, quote the most primitive beginnings and the latest European endings. End quote. Trotsky, nineteen o five. Did anyone beyond a Tolstoy still believe at the outset of the twentieth century that Russia? unlike the West, should or could strive to create some pastoral ideal based on her peasants and on the on simple but fundamental values, thus avoiding what Marx once called the, quote, fatal vicissitudes, end quote, the, quote, pitiless laws, end quote, and the, quote, deleterious influences, end quote, of the modern capitalist world. <laughs> Footnote. Marx used these epithets when describing, discussing the issue whether Russia could avoid capitalism. See the appendix below. And footnote. By then, if not before, the old populist dream of a Russian socialism growing out of indigenous rural institutions, the Obschina, or village commune in particular, had been largely exploded by the seemingly inexorable developments of the last decades of the 19th century, and even Tolstoy was now regarded as somewhat of an eccentric, albeit a respected and powerful eccentric. At the time of the revolution of 1905, Russia was not yet, not even nearly, an industrial, much less a capitalist nation, but even but evolution in this direction seemed irreversible. Footnote. On the Marxist populist arguments concerning the nature of Russia's future, see A.P. Mendel, Dilemmas of Progress in Tsarist Russia, Legal Marxism, and Legal Populism. On the ideas of the various leading populists, see Franco Venturi, Roots of Revolution, published 1960, and the introduction to this work by Asaya Berlin. I don't have any description for Mendel's book. Um... Uh, it was looked like it was republished in in, in uh, 2001, uh, Franco Venturi's book. Long recognized as a classic, Venturi's authoritative work, Roots of Revolution, captures the early and intriguing, intriguing period of the Russian Revolution, starting with the 1848 rebellion and ending with the 1888 assassination of Alexander II. Roots of Revolution examines Russia's internal and external problems, the ideals and beliefs of Russia's subjects, and, most importantly, the conspiracies and struggle through which populism expressed populism self with a revised author's introduction. Quote, the most thoughtful me, quote, the most thorough survey of the Russian revolutionary movement before 1881, dot, 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 penetrating and readable, with an admirable balance between biography, theory, and action, end quote, TLS, quote, profound and wide-ranging, end quote, C.V. Wedgwood. Back to the text and footnote. The problem of the gap, or at any rate the difference between Russia and the West, did not, of course, arise originally at this time. <laughs> 
It is a theme running through Russian history from at least the reign of Peter the Great, and in the 19th century it may be said to have pervaded in an obsessive manner the whole of the country's cultural and intellectual life, its literature, its social thought, its educational system, its, quote, high society, end quote. Their reactions to the West as a model to be imitated could be as passionately negative as positive. Whatever the reaction, however, comparison became unavoidable, and, in fact, the more Russia came to resemble the West, the more Russia's backwardness seemed to protrude. If this is a paradox, it is one arising from the very concept of backwardness, as it took root in Russia, and as it will concern us in what follows. Footnote, quote, backwardness, end quote, as well as the adjective, quote, backward, and quote, under development, as well as, quote, underdeveloped, are terms frequently used interchangeably in the modern literature on this subject, and what follows, although no essential distinction is intended, and the two sets of terms may generally be taken to correspond, quote, backwardness and, quote, backward, have been used throughout, and this for three reasons. Firstly, they are the terms Trotsky himself used. Secondly, quote, under development, and, quote, underdeveloped, end quote, appear to be terms which were applied to particular regions of the world in the context of post-World War II history. <laughs> and, thirdly, the words, quote, underdevelopment and, quote, underdeveloped do not seem to convey the clear social and historical demarcation of uniqueness, which is an integral part of Trotsky's conception of backwardness. The latter term, it is true, is sometimes taken to be offensive, but obviously no moral judgment, whatever is intended, and it is used throughout as a neutral, descriptive term. End footnote. Backwardness is a term signifying a certain relation. There are obviously no absolute criteria according to which a society may be described as backward, and only comparison, in terms of some preconceived normative scale, makes it so. The standard of comparison may be arbitrary, and the standard of comparison is certainly always historically conditioned. Yet such comparison is commonplace, and, insofar as such comparison relates to certain general features of societies, hardly in dispute, thus an ag agricultural society, to take one obvious example, is said to be backward and industrial one advanced. Authority based on religious precepts is characteristic of backwardness, some based on secular, positive laws of modernity, and so on. Footnote. It should be stressed, again, that these are descriptive definitions, though the notion that one form of society is more, quote, progressive, end quote, or in any sense, quote, better than another, a notion which, as we will see, is inherent in Trotsky's comparison of Russian with Western societies is, of course, a normative one. <laughs> and footnote. Some societies, in this sense, are, of course, less or more backward than others, but beyond the question of extent, there is another sense in which not all societies are backward in the same way. Such societies as have been designated primitive by anthropologists or others which Marx called, quote, Asiatic, are certainly backward according to the accepted Western norms, which are, in fact, the norms of comparison. But in their case, backwardness is a designation imposed from outside and unrecognized, or rather meaningless, from the point of the view of the societies themselves, and this for the very reason that Western norms have either not penetrated them or have not been assimilated or adopted even by their intellectual, political, or other elites. <laughs> Footnote, for a discussion of the theoretical literature on, quote, primitive or, quote, traditional societies, see Georges Balandier, Political Anthropology, published in I can't find any description of that book. End footnote. Um, where am I? Uh, 
It is otherwise with a second category of societies where backwardness is internally recognized or felt. For, if in the case of, quote, primitive or, quote, Asiatic societies, change, development, what is commonly called, quote, progress, are largely unknown features, and backwardness does not constitute a problem. In the case of the latter, such features are as if a product of their consciousness of being and, for them, backwardness itself becomes a social and political problem. Such a distinction is crucial. For Russia, at the beginning of the 20th century and before, obviously belonged to the second category, and it is this phenomenon of backwardness which concerned Trotsky. Trotsky was interested not in backward, quote, primitive societies where stability, community, excuse me, stability, continuity, harmony even, were seemingly eternal features, but rather in a backward society where the very opposite was the case. Trotsky was preoccupied, we may say, with the problem of change and with backwardness as a source of change and ultimately of revolutionary change. The point of departure for Trotsky was, therefore, the series of questions. Under what conditions does backwardness become a social and political problem? Under what conditions does backwardness become, excuse me, does backwardness generate conflict? Under what conditions may it be seen as the motive force of revolution? And what kind of revolution? At the back of all this stood the paradox we referred to earlier, of Russia's backwardness seemingly becoming the more conspicuous, the more unbearable, the more Russia became like the West. Okay, so that's like the introduction to like the chapter. Now is, this is the section of the chapter that I'm reading. Uh, Uh, the section is titled Social and Economic Development of Russia, the Impact of the West. Footnote. As was explained in the preface, this study of Trotsky's thought, though set within a general chronological framework, is arranged according to subject matter. Consequently, in this and the following chapter in particular, the exposition and analysis of Trotsky's views of Russian society and Trotsky's theory of revolution are based in his writings both during the period following 1905 and later years as well, including the 1920s and 1930s. This seems legitimate for a number of reasons. Firstly, the subject is theoretical and not strictly dependent on this or that particular event. Secondly, Trotsky's conception of the Russian Revolution was based on conclusions reached from an analysis of Russian history and society before 1905. Thirdly, Trotsky's later assumptions are consistent with his earlier assumptions, being based on the same theoretical assumptions. The later writings are a refinement of the earlier writings and do not constitute a separate body of work. There is no, quote, younger Trotsky, end quote, against a, quote, older Trotsky, end quote. The present approach allows us, therefore, to see Trotsky's thought in its wholeness. End footnote. Results and Prospects, the book, written and first published in 1906, was Trotsky's first major work devoted to social theory and was to remain, together with parts of 1905, Trotsky's fullest account of the sociology of Russian historical development. Okay, I was so seeing if there's anything for results and prospects online. Um, anyway, here we go. Um, back to the text. Uh, results and prospects first chapter begins with the following paragraph. Quote, if we compare social development in Russia with social development in European countries, taking European countries as one from the point of view of that which their history has in common and which distinguishes, distinguishes European countries 
from the history of Russia, then we can say that the main characteristics of Russian social development emerges to be its comparative primitiveness and slowness, end quote. Trotsky. Is it raining? It might be raining. End quote, Trotsky. Twenty-five years later, opening his monumental history of the Russian Revolution, Trotsky would write, quote, The fundamental and most stable feature of Russian history is the slow tempo of Russia's development, with the economic backwardness, primitiveness of social forms, and low level of culture resulting from it, end quote. Backwardness or primitiveness, this obvious but striking feature of Russian development, was at the root of the whole of Trotsky's analysis of Russian society. Yet the important element for Trotsky in this backwardness was that it was never really total. In fact, Russia's social development never remained, quote, isolated and under the influence of inner tendencies only, end quote. On the contrary, quote, Russian social life, built up on a certain inter internal economic foundation, has all the time been under the influence, even under the pressure, of its external social historical milieu, end quote. Trotsky. This, then, was the sui generis element which, on the one hand, distinguished Russia from Asiatic societies, and on the other, made comparison with the West relevant. Alright. Sorry, I gotta go inside. The, quote, external social historical milieu, end quote, of which Trotsky spoke was not that of the East. Had it been only that it, that, it would not have differed in its essentials from the kind of external contacts which, contacts which characterize the relations of a China or an India with their neighbors. In the case of Russia, geography had, quote, blessed Russia with borders in Europe, and geography, according to Trotsky, determined her destiny no less, perhaps more, than that of other countries. Thus not the Tatars, in Trotsky's view, were the real danger or the main influence. With them, Russia could stand on a par given, even given the primitiveness of Russia's economic foundations. The primary hazard was from the West, from Lithuania, Poland, Sweden, from societies whose economic organizations were on a higher level than that of Russia. To such societies, Russia might have easily succumbed had she not chosen to fight them off by adopting their own methods. In fact, of course, she did not really choose. She was forced to do so by the very exigencies of self-preservation. Consequently, it was these societies and not the Tatars who, quote, compelled old Russia to introduce firearms and create standing regiments, dot, 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 who later on forced her to form nightly cavalry and infantry forces, end quote. Trotsky. Quote, the East gave Russia the Tatar yoke, which entered as an important element in the structure of the Russian state. The West was a still more threatening foe, but at the same time a teacher. Russia was unable to settle in the forms of the East because Russia was continually having to adapt Russia's self to military and economic pressure from the West. End quote. Trotsky, The History of, History of the Russian Revolution, Book 1. Confronted by the Western threat, Russia thus developed a military technology, this initial influence was not directly economic, but it had economic implications and, eventually, consequences. To prepare her own army for a clash with stronger neighbors, Russia had to modernize her military might. The Russian state thus was thus impelled to create, quote, an industry, a technique, to engage in her services military specialists, dot, 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 to establish naval schools, factories, Bracket and so on, and bracket, end quote. Trotsky, 1905. Henceforth, 
Russia was irreversibly set on a course not only different but unique, since it would involve the maintenance of contradictory economic foundations. Trotsky traced how during an extended period almost the whole of Russia's internal resources were devoted to military and defense needs. Most of the state budget was earmarked for the upkeep of troops. In the second half of the 18th century, as much as 70%. In the first half of the 19th century, nevertheless, so me, never less than 50%. Excuse me, let me repeat that. Most of the state budget was earmarked for the upkeep of troops. In the second half of the 18th century, as much as 70%. In the first half of the 19th, never less than 50%. <coughs> the only possible source for such funds was the peasantry, which, as a result, bore the brunt of the financial pressures. The peasants were subjected to arbitrary taxation rates, always excessive and always beyond the peasants' means. The consequence was a disruption of peasant life and economy. Quote, the state pounced upon the, quote, essential product, end quote, of the peasant, deprived the peasant of his livelihood, caused the peasant to flee from the land upon which the peasant had not even had time to settle, and thus hampered the growth of the population and the development of the productive forces, dot, dot, dot. Inasmuch as it took away an important part of the essential product, it destroyed even those primitive production bases upon which it depended, end quote. Trotsky. Simultaneously, however, the state was undermining the possessing classes on whom the state had to depend to, disproportionate, to a disproportionate extent. Determined to increase the size of its coffers, the state controlled and regimented the nobility, and in this way succeeded in swallowing up a large part of the, quote, surplus product. This naturally retarded the development of this sector of society as well, which was either, quote, bureaucratized, recruited into administrative service, or in any case, already stagnated by the system of serfdom which discouraged the growth of an independent non-agricultural-based class. The emancipation of 1861 came, from the point of view of the nobility, too late. By then, its strengths and resources had been sapped. As for the peasants, Trotsky believed that the emancipation simply unharnessed them, that they might be the more easily recruited into the armed forces, and they more efficiently taxed through, commun through, commun through the communes, without, however, opening up for them any realistic new prospects. Footnote. Trotsky argued that the decision to emancipate the peasants was governed by industrial needs, that is, by the need to create a free labor force. End footnote. Thus the effects of external exigencies, initially at least, were harmfully economic, but socially certain, quote, progressive changes were instituted, not because the state was interested in social reforms, but because they were necessitated by external needs. In all likelihood, they would not have been carried out had it been simply a matter of internal pressures. The emancipation itself was an example of this, even if it did not have immediate social consequences. Another was the already noted need to introduce at least a minimally advanced economic infrastructure for military production, one which would be initially burdensome from the point of view of the economy as a whole, but which would eventually serve as the basis for further social development. Still another was the evolution of a contradictory policy toward the possessing classes. On the one hand, as Trotsky had argued, the state, by economically undermining the, quote, estates, was preventing their growth and social differentiation. But on the other hand, the, quote, state needed a hierarchical organization of estates, end quote, in order to survive, since its military goals could not be realized without a functional differentiation of its elites. Footnote. By quote, a state, end quote, Trotsky meant a social group which had certain rights and obligations, formally defined by law and recognized as such by the state. A quote, a state was not equivalent to the Marxist notion of quote, class, though it was that quote, pre-capitalist, end quote, social grouping from which a class might later develop. End footnote. 
Thus it had, thus the elite, I mean, thus the state had to have and create entrepreneurs as well as army officers, merchants, as well as bureaucrats. This had the effect of introducing the kind of distinctions which had also characterized the early development of Western society and which, there, eventually led to a confrontation between, the, between state interest and those of the estates, culminating in the triumph of the latter. In Russia, however, the differentiation between estates subsequently culminated in another, vic another way. This was again initially due to the fact that the estates had never been allowed to become independent economically. And since differentiation was a function of state, military, and foreign interests, it remained, uh, differentiation remained under the aegis of the autocracy itself. This is not to say that the estates had themselves been created by the state. Trot Trotsky rejected as an exaggeration the view, which Trotsky attributed to Milyukov, that, quote, while in the West the estates created the state, in Russia, state power created the estates, end quote. Trotsky. Excuse me. Trotsky attributed as an exaggeration the view which Trotsky attributed to Milyukov, that, quote, while in the West the estates created the state, in Russia, state power created the estates, end quote. I guess that's Trotsky, the, the view that Trotsky attributed to Milyukov. Quote, estates cannot be created by state action, by law, before one or another social group can take shape as a privileged state, the help of state power, it must have developed economically with all its social advantages. Estates cannot be manufactured according to a previously established scale of ranks or according to the code of the Légion des Honneurs. State power can but assist with all state power's resources the elementary economic process which brings forward higher economic formations. End quote. Trotsky. Footnote. Trotsky's difference with Milyukov derived, of course, from the Marxist view that economics preceded social formations. End footnote. So the basis for economic differentiation had already come into being in Russia. Nevertheless, the basis for economic differentiation was rudimentary and stultified. And because of the particular power of the Russian state, a, gro a power growing directly out of the military edifice it had created for the defense of the nation, the estates could never align themselves vis-a-vis -vis the state. The estates could never align themselves vis-a-vis -vis the state from an independent position. Thus the state did with them as the state more or less wished, quote, dot, 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 while undermining the economic foundations, bracket, excuse me, quote, dot, 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 while undermining the economic foundations of, bracket, the estates, and bracket, end quote. Shit, God damn it. Let me restart. Thus the state did with the estates as the state more or less wished, quote, dot, 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 while undermining the economic foundations of the estate's development, the state fun simultaneously strove to force the development of these foundations by government measures, and, like any other state, strove to turn this development of estates to the state's own advantage, end quote. Trotsky. The result was that a real struggle between state and estates could never materialize. The balance of powers was too one-sided. The Tsar's, quote, freedom of movement incomparably greater than that of the king in European monarchies, end quote. Trotsky. 1905. The estates developed, but as an appendage to the state. Functioning at the state's, quote, discretion and in the state's service, lacking autonomous power or even status, leading an almost parasitical existence. In this way, the phenomenon known as Russian despotism became possible, a huge, centralized and bureaucratic autocracy, unmediated by any social grouping, between it and the masses, no social, economic, or political bridge. Tsarism became a, quote, 
intermediate form standing between European absolutism and Asian despotism, and perhaps approaching, if anything, Asian despotism, end quote. Trotsky. Yet Trotsky stressed that this very fact, this impurity or uniqueness of form, both political and economic, was a direct, even if protracted, result of the impact of the West upon Russia. Moreover, its significance was that it is what limited Russian backwardness, or rather reduced the extent of her backwardness, and made her, quote, advanced development possible. Simultaneously, however, it made internal instability and even, eventually, conflict inevitable. To show this, Trotsky now traced the further development of the Russian economy. However much the state squeezed internal resources, it remained short of the necessary means for pursuing the state's military goals. There was, in any case, a limit to what the Russian economy could provide. The Russian economy was, after all, still based on, quote, primitive economic foundations, end quote. And the Russian economy was not growing from within because the state had largely prevented the economy growing from within, becoming possible. But the more the state stood in the way of natural economic growth, the more the state found itself endangered by the lack of economic growth. Military confrontation with the West could not succeed in the end without further economic emulation of the West. To resist the latter, the West, and compete with the West, the state had to copy its methods, had to copy the West's methods again. Quote, Thus the Russian state, erected on the basis of Russian economic conditions, was being pushed forward by the friendly and even more <laughs> by the hostile pressure of the neighboring state organizations, which had grown up on a higher economic basis. From a certain moment, <laughs> especially from the end of the 17th century, the state strove <laughs> with all the state's power to accelerate the country's natural economic development. New branches of handicraft, machinery, factories, Big industry, capital, were, so to say, artificially grafted onto the natural economic stem. Capitalism seemed to be an offspring of the state, end quote. Trotsky. The word, quote, artificially, end quote, must be here stressed as representing the key to Trotsky's conception of Russian history during the 18th and 19th centuries. <laughs> footnote, quote, from this standpoint, Trotsky added, Quote, it could be said that all Russian science is the artificial product of government effort and artificial grafting on the natural stem of national ignorance, end quote, Trotsky. And in a footnote, Trotsky claimed that the school system was also, quote, artificial, end quote, governed by state needs. End footnote. What developed during this modern period was, quote, artificial, end quote, because, firstly, it was not initiated or even demanded by internal needs or classes and thus not dictated by any response to internal social or economic interests. And, secondly, because it was not motivated by a desire to develop industrial forces, but, quote, by purely fiscal and in part military technical considerations, end quote. Trotsky. Does this mean that in Trotsky's view, the development of capitalist foundations, which now proceeded apace, was not inevitable in Russia? It was not inevitable if one sees Russia as a free agent or a separate independent entity outside the European framework. In that case, there were not sufficient internal reasons or social groups for instigating industrial growth. But, in fact, it was inevitable because the whole point about Russia's history is that Russia was not a free agent, not an isolated Eastern or Asiatic society, but subject to the continuous pressures of the West. <laughs>
Thus, from the point of view of Russia's internal social structure, new economic forms were bound to appear artificial and not organic. From the point of view of our external needs, they were both unavoidable and rational. But by the time this came to be, the, quote, internalization, end quote, of external needs had itself affected the social structure. The differentiation of estates, of which Trotsky had spoken earlier, though it had not gone deep, had yet created the inevitable structural changes. These same estates could not independently initiate economic activity, but these same estates were so placed now that should the initiative come from above, these same estates would respond positively to that initiative. Thus the state did not build in a vacuum. The formal prerequisite, economic and functional differentiation, was already there. With it, a dormant, latent, but unequivocal trend had been created. The state now gave it the push it needed. This did not make new economic forms any less artificial, considering the general level and extent of economic and social development, but neither were they completely without foundations. They could not, however, be introduced through internal resources alone, since these internal resources were insufficient to provide the kind of financial effort which was needed to establish industry. Having no independent economic base, deprived of its, quote, surplus product, end quote, by the state, the propertied classes had no capital of the propertied class's own, and without capital, the state could not, quote, graft on, end quote, capitalism. So the state did the only thing possible. The state turned to the European bourgeoisie. Thus began the era of the direct intervention of European business interest into the internal economy of Russia. Henceforth, the state was to be in pawn to the, quote, European stock exchange, a prisoner of huge and exorbitant loans. On the one hand, these loans were essential to the modernization of the Russian economy. On the other, since these loans' repayment could be effected only through higher taxation, They would lead to the further impoverishment of the general population and, simultaneously, would prevent the accumulation of internal wealth. Thus, from the outset, while a modern economy was being created, it was already undermined, a house built on sand. In the meantime, however, the state could live under the illusion of unchallenged strength, the huge army which it built up larger than anything which even France knew before or after 1789, assured the Tsar of, quote, internal domination, end quote, Trotsky. And, of course, it allowed him, the Tsar, not only to ensure the defense of the Tsar's frontiers, but to dabble in European matters. Alexander I in 1815, Nicholas I in 1848, and so forth. The semblance of power was sufficient to divert each czar from the internal contradictions of what had been created. Russia was indeed an autocracy, institutionally resembling some Asiatic despotism, but the assimilation of, quote, European technique and capital armed Russia with all the resources which are the attribute of great Western powers, end quote. Trotsky, 1905. And this, naturally, only whetted Russia's appetite. In the course of the latter part of the 19th century, Russia plunged ahead, confronting the world like a, quote, invincible power, end quote. Trotsky. Okay, so that's the end of this section, uh, which again was titled, um, come on, uh, Social and Economic Development of Russia, the impact of the West. The next section, if you're interested um, in trying to find these out, is titled The Impact of Industrialization. But I don't know if I'm going to uh, put these videos up uh, under their titles because it kind of doesn't make sense to say, Brock Knight Paz, The Impact of Industrialization. I might put something like um, Brock Knight Paz on uh, Trotsky's interpretation of uh, the impact of industrialization on Russia. So...
Um, thanks for listening.